This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thanks again for joining me as we study God's Word together. Uh, my name is Mark Rogers and I'm pastor of Kenmore Community Church. And it's a pleasure having you uh, join us for our online uh, worship and sermon time. I always like to begin our time together with prayer, so please uh, join me as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we do recognize that this is the day that you have made and we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, we thank you for the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you, uh, Lord, just for your grace and your mercy and, and your presence with us each and every day. We thank you, Lord, for for all of those many spiritual blessings. And we thank you for the uh, material blessings we have, too, for family and friends and homes and uh, jobs and food and clothing and shelter. Uh, we recognize that everything we have comes from your hand, and we give you the glory and the honor and the praise for all of it. Uh, each of us, Lord, has concerns on our hearts and minds today, and we want to lay them at the foot of the cross. We believe, Lord, that uh, you are concerned about every single detail of our lives, and so we cast all our cares upon you, knowing that we care that you care for us. We pray for those who have health concerns, for your healing touch in their life. We pray for those uh, that are having economic concerns, and we pray for your provision there, and for those, Lord, that are having mental and emotional struggles and anxiety and fear. We pray for your peace to guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And uh, Father, we do pray for our nation today as we've recently uh, inaugurated a new president and whether we voted for him or not, we recognize that uh, you are the one that raises up leaders and takes down leaders and you call us to pray uh, for our governmental leaders. And so we do pray for our president and the cabinet that he's forming and we pray for the Congress, the senators, the House of Representatives and we pray, Father, that you by your spirit would give wisdom and guidance and direction and that, and that they would seek your wisdom, guidance, and direction in the decisions they're making and the policies they're seeking to uh, implement. And Father, we, um, we also want to pray here at Kenmore Community Church for our families of the week. We pray for Paul and Ida Nichols and uh, Julie and Alicia, their daughters. We pray for Bob and Dina Pan and Jonathan and Ethan, their sons. We pray for Reza and Jamila. And Lord, we lift these folks to you and pray that this week they would just have an extra special blessing from you, that they would have a keen awareness of your love for them, and uh, that, Lord, they would each continue to grow and mature in their relationship to you and uh, carry out the ministry that you have called them to do. We also want to pray for our mission focus today, which is the Timothy Initiative. We thank you for this mission organization and the work they do in planting uh, micro churches around the world and their recent goal of uh, planting a church in the 700,000 villages that uh, they have identified in the nation of India. And so, Lord, we do pray uh, for the success of that. And it's uh, just amazing that they can train a, a church planter and plant a church for $350. And uh, we as a church here have set a goal that we could. Uh, uh, plant 10 of those churches this year, Lord. So help us to be uh, faithful in our giving and our stewardship, and uh, we pray that in some small way we can have uh, a kingdom impact there in India through these uh, churches planted by the Timothy Initiative. And now, Father, once again, we are blessed to be able to study your word and and meditate upon it and think about it and see how it applies to our life today. So we pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would illuminate our understanding as we continue our study of the book of Ezekiel. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we continue our study of the book of Ezekiel today, uh, we're going to be looking at chapters 2 and 3. And it's uh, more important probably than ever that you have a Bible in front of you as we study the book of Ezekiel. Uh, we're going to be chew, uh, biting off big chunks of the book as we study it. And uh, chapters 2 and 3 uh, are uh, you know, part of that process today. And it, I think just would be very helpful to you if you could follow along as I read it and have the scriptures open in front of you as we study it. By way of a quick review, let me remind you what we know about the book of Ezekiel so far. 
Uh, it was written by Ezekiel, who was called by God to be a prophet, uh, to his people, the Israelites, while they were in exile in Babylon. Uh, he had been one of the uh, up-and-coming leaders in Jerusalem, training to be a priest, and when the Babylonians came in the first time around and uh, took uh, into exile the, the leading citizens of uh, the kingdom of, of Judah, he was one of them. And so he's been in uh, uh, Babylon for about five years before he has uh, had that vision that we talked about last week of the likeness of the glory of God and today we're going to see how he was actually called by God to be a prophet to his people there but God's people are in exile in Babylon because of their disobedience and rebellion against him and their idolatry and their refusal to live in submission to uh, his commands and so uh, God had sent prophet after prophet to them, calling them to repent and return wholeheartedly to him, but they didn't do it. And so God finally uh, allowed the Babylonians to come in, and he was uh, their rod of discipline, or the Babylonians were God's rod of discipline on his people, and they were carried off into captivity in Babylon, which was going to last about 70 years. In chapter 1, uh, as we saw last week, Ezekiel was given this vision of the glory of God, and that vision was meant to remind e Ezekiel and God's people of God's omniscience, his omnipotence, uh, his omnipresence, uh, and his mercy and grace. It, it was a spectacular vision of God's holiness and of his, the likeness of his glory. And as we talked about previously, the, the main theme of the book of Ezekiel is this, that you will know that I am God. That phrase occurs in Ezekiel uh, about 50 times. And so this is God's purpose in disciplining his people that during this time of exile, they would come to remember and refocus on the fact that he is God, that you will know that I am God, that they would repent of their sin and begin to submit to his reign and rule in their life wholeheartedly. So that's a quick review. But now if you've got the scriptures in front of you, which I hope you do, I want you to follow along as I read Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3. It's a little bit of a longer reading, but I think it's important that we hear uh, the entire counsel of the Word of God from these two chapters. Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I'm sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, and whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll, then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. He then said to me, Son of man, go now to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. You are not being sent to a people of obscure speech and difficult language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many peoples of obscure speech and difficult language whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I had sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the house of Israel is not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. For the whole house of Israel is hardened and obstinate. But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. 
And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully and take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your countrymen in exile and speak to them. Say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a loud rumbling sound. May the glory of the Lord be praised in his dwelling place, the sound of the wings of the living creatures brushing against each other, and the sound of the wheels beside them, a loud rumbling sound. The Spirit then lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and in the anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord upon me. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Abib near the Kabar River, and there where they were living I sat among them for seven days overwhelmed. At the end of the seven days the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel, so hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do not warn the wicked man, if you do warn the wicked man, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die for his sin, but you will be saved yourself. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die. Since you did not warn him, he will die for his sin. The righteous things he did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the righteous man not to sin, and he does not sin, he will surely live, because he took warning, and you will have saved yourself. The hand of the Lord was upon me there, and he said to me, Get up and go out to the plain, and there I will speak to you. So I got up and went out to the plain, and the glory of the Lord was standing there, the glory like I had seen by the Kibar River, and I fell face down. Then the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. He spoke to me and said, Go shut yourself inside your house, and you, son of man, they will tie with ropes so that you will be bound, so that you cannot go out among the people. I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth, so that you will be silent and unable to rebuke them, though they are a rebellious house. But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Whoever will listen, let him listen, and whoever will refuse, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. Well, my main thought uh, from this message today that I want to share with you is that God provides everything his ambassadors need to uh, take his entire message to all the peoples and places that he sends them. So first of all, I want us to think about the fact that, uh, you know, just like Ezekiel, we may be given a difficult ministry. Let's think about this difficult ministry, first of all, that God gave to Ezekiel. At the end of chapter 1, we left Ezekiel face down in the presence of the likeness of the glory of God, and uh, God was just about to speak to him. And as chapter 2 begins, Ezekiel is helped to his feet by the Holy Spirit as God delivers a message to him. Uh, Ezekiel is called uh, Son of Man, and he's called Son of Man over 90 times in this book. And while the title, The Son of Man, is given to Jesus in fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel and was a messianic term, simply Son of Man is a more common term in the Bible and simply means man or human. It emphasizes the humanity of a person. So in the case of Ezekiel, who was often referred to as son of man, God probably chose this manner of address, uh, of direct address simply to point up the contrast between the human condition of Ezekiel and the transcendent majesty of God. The prophet couldn't help but realize his own human frailty and limitations in the face of God's unsurpassable glory. God is God, and Ezekiel is but a son of man. That's something we need to remember, too. God is God, and we are not. The message given to Ezekiel by God was that he was going to be God's messenger to the Israelites, and that his ministry would be difficult. Uh, I just picked out a few of the phrases in this passage that, that shows the difficulty of his mission, but let me read it. Uh, God said to him, uh, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. Uh, he went on to say, the people I'm sending you to are obstinate and stubborn. And he, he told Ezekiel, say to them, this is what the Lord says. Uh, and then went on to say, but the, the house of Israel isn't going isn't to be willing to listen to you because they're not willing to listen to me. 
for the whole house of Israel is hardened and obstinate. So God didn't paint a rosy picture to Ezekiel of the ministry that he was calling him to. He told the prophet his audience would be rebellious, they'd be obstinate, they'd be stubborn, they wouldn't listen. And in addition, God told Ezekiel that at times their words and actions might cause him to be afraid and discouraged, but God would make him even tougher and empower him by the Holy Spirit. I'm wondering if you've ever not wanted to go to someone and share what the Lord asked you to share with him or her. I'm sure the prophet Nathan, when God came to him and told him he was to go to King David and confront King David about his sin with Bathsheba, I'm sure he wasn't too excited about that difficult assignment either. As God's ambassador, Ezekiel didn't have authority to change his assignment or his audience, and neither do we. Uh, ministry is difficult because people are difficult and continue to live in rebellion against God. The only hope of breaking people's hardness of heart and head is the same as it was in Ezekiel's day. God's word clearly spoken and used by the Holy Spirit to convict people of their sin and rebellions against God and draw them to Christ. Uh, to that end, Jesus has commissioned his followers to go and make disciples of all nations, according to Matthew 28, 18-20. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation and that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. That's found in 2 Corinthians 5, 18-21. So we too have a calling and a commission, uh, just like Ezekiel, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that, that that ministry is going to be easy. In fact, in many ways, it's difficult. Uh, what's your ministry audience like? How much do your neighbors or co-workers love to hear about Jesus? Uh, what about your non-Christian family members at the holidays? Are they begging you for you to, to talk to them uh, more about what you believe and who Jesus is? Um, I just encourage you in the midst of all of that, don't be discouraged and don't be afraid. Overcoming minds that are hostile, futile, and darkened is what God does every day and what he did for you and me. We were once a difficult audience ourselves, but his grace overcame all of the hardness of our hearts. Remembered how he res remember how he rescued you and continue to reach out to those outside of Christ with his words of life, those people that God brings into your life. So we see here that uh, Ezekiel was given a difficult ministry, and we too may be given a difficult ministry. And then secondly, we see in the passage that we may be given a difficult message. A knowledge uh, that, or knowing that our audience does not want to hear what we're going to share with them may tempt us to try to change the message. And many people today have watered down the gospel message of Jesus Christ in an attempt to make it more palatable to those that they're trying to share it with. But like Ezekiel, we have no authority to change the message that we've been given. Besides having that difficult ministry, Ezekiel was entrusted with a difficult message that included words of lament, mourning, and woe. Can you imagine? This is what God is telling him to share with the people. Words of lament, mourning and woe. I'm sure Ezekiel will say, yay, I get to share this with the people. Uh, that'll draw a crowd, you know, that'll make me popular. The prophet's responsibility, though, was to listen carefully to all of God's words and take them to heart. He was then to say to the people, this is what the Lord God says. Now, Paul exhorted the church at Colossae to let God's word dwell in them richly, and they were teaching and admonishing and uh, to, to let the Word of God dwell in them richly as they were teaching and admonishing uh, one another in all wisdom. Internalization of the message would not be a problem for Ezekiel. God made sure his prophet consumed his word. In fact, he fed Ezekiel the scroll that had these lamentations and mournings and woe written all over it. And surprisingly, it didn't taste bitter to Ezekiel. He said it tasted as sweet as honey. With this action, I believe that God was teaching Ezekiel that to be really effective for God in our Christian lives, his word has to become part of us. So let's pause for a moment and just ask ourselves, how deeply 
is the Word of God dwelling in each one of us. When making decisions and sharing wisdom and responding to questions from non-believers, is it the Word of God that we bring to bear on a situation? When we share the Word of God, are we sharing you know, the whole counsel of God? Are we sharing the bad news as well as the good news? People don't like to hear about the judgment of God. They just want to hear about the grace and the love of God. But I would say to you that unless people fully understand the bad news, why we need the grace of God, why we need the love of God, they're never truly going to appreciate the grace of God and the love of God. And, uh, you know, I I like Romans 6.23 for that purpose because in one verse we have both the good news and the bad news. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here in that verse we've got the bad news, the wages of sin is death. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We deserve His judgment, we deserve to be forever separated from Him, but... The grace of God shows up in that verse as well, that that God in Christ has died on the cross for our sins so that we can be forgiven. And when we put our faith and trust in Him, then we can have uh, the forgiveness of our sins, we can enter into that relationship with God, we can have an abundant life now, an eternal life hereafter. And this is the full counsel of God that we need to share with people. Not just the good news. People aren't going to appreciate the good news until they understand the need for the good news. And the only way to understand that need is by understanding how bad the bad news is. So are you sharing the bad news as well as the good news when you talk with folks? And what's your plan for internalizing the Word of God in your life? Do you have a habit of daily reading God's Word and meditating upon it and thinking about it and chewing on it and really asking the Holy Spirit to tell you how it applies to your life? Well, God also wanted Ezekiel to know that he was not responsible for the response to the message, but only the delivery of it. Whether they listened or refused to listen, Ezekiel's only task was to deliver God's word to these people so that they would know that a prophet had been among them. The messenger's job was to get the message to the ears of his audience, but only the Lord can get it to the heart, and we too need to remember that fact. The third point in my message today from Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3 is that we will be given divine means. When God gives us a ministry and a message, He gives us the divine means to carry it out. Imagine with me for a moment that you're Ezekiel and you've just been asked to take a difficult message to a difficult group of people. And now imagine God closing His assignment by saying, Good luck, give it your best shot. If left to his own power, Ezekiel would have had an impossible mission. Fortunately, all that God expects from us, he provides for us. God told Ezekiel, But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. God would not send Ezekiel against rebellious and obstinate people who would speak difficult words to him and cast discouraging looks in his direction without supplying him all that he needed to fulfill the mission. In fact, Ezekiel's very name means God strengthens. How would God strengthen and empower Ezekiel? Well, we get a clue to this in the in the second verse of chapter 2. Um, where, uh, you know, Ezekiel has been flat on his face before this vision of the glorious, uh, of the likeness of the glory of God, and God begins to speak to him, and what happens next? It says that God put his spirit in him and even lifted him to his feet. Ezekiel couldn't even stand before God without the help of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit was going to be the one dwelling in him, empowering him, to carry out this difficult ministry and to, to deliver this d- difficult message to uh, God's people. And like Ezekiel, we have been given a difficult assignment. Our king has charged us to go to every nation and make disciples. And he wants us to teach them to obey everything that he's commanded. 
and we can know, however, that we will have every provision necessary because he has promised his presence with us. When, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he, he said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And we know now that his presence with us is through the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit. So are you relying on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in what you are saying and doing for Jesus? Are you praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis? And the fourth point I'd share with you today is uh, what we do uh, definitely matters. Uh, we see this here in the proclamation of Ezekiel's message. Uh, God told him that he was to go and to proclaim the message, and uh, if wicked people uh, didn't listen to him, uh, that was all right. As long as he proclaimed the message, then their blood would not be on his hands. And if they heard the message and they repented, then that would be great. And he said the same thing about righteous people. If people are thinking their own righteousness, they're right with God, and they ignore Ezekiel's message to them of the need to repent, then that would be on them, that, that their blood would not be on Ezekiel's hands. But if he proclaimed the message, and these righteous people turned away from their own self-righteousness and to the righteousness that only comes from God, then they too uh, would be saved. And so, you know, the, the, the proclamation of the message matters. And in our day, uh, God has chosen to speak through us as well. He's given us this commission. We are his ambassadors as though he is making his appeal through us. Now, unlike in Ezekiel's day, um, you know, our salvation doesn't depend on our proclaiming the gospel. Our salvation is based uh, not on our own works, but on what Christ has done for us. But nevertheless, it's an act of obedience on our part, and God holds us responsible to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. But the response to the message is not on us. That's on God. We are called to proclaim the message, both the good news and the bad news, and uh, leave that the response of people to God. He is the only one through His Spirit who can take a person's heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. So uh, it matters. And then we have the, the message matters. And then uh, the, we have here the, uh, the preparation of the messenger. That matters as well. Uh, as the third chapter of Ezekiel draws to a close, the prophet shares how God planned to prepare him for his assignment. Now, doesn't it seem odd that after Ezekiel has been assigned as the watchman for his people, he is then told that he will be mute and bound, that his tongue will stick to the roof of his mouth, and it will only be loosed when God gives him a message to share with the people. Now, I don't think his tongue could have literally been stuck to the roof of his mouth the entire time, because, you know, we need our tongues to swallow and to eat and so forth. But I, I think that he was unable to speak anything to God's people uh, except what God put in his mouth, the message that God gave to him. So he could not give them any kind of false hope or any of that. All he could do was speak these words of lament and woe and judgment to God's people. And he could only do it when God gave him a, a particular message to deliver uh, to them. But that's interesting that God says, I'm giving you this ministry, I'm giving you this message, but by the way, I'm going to cause your tongue to stick to the roof of your mouth and, and you to be bound in ropes. And so, you know, how, how are you going to do, do this? Well, why did God prepare him this way? I think it's so that Ezekiel's peers would know that, that he was not his own anymore. And that any time they saw him and any time he opened his mouth, it was because God had given uh, Ezekiel a word to give to them. And God was allowing him to be out roaming around and sharing that message. Other than that, they wouldn't have seen Ezekiel. So um, it, it was because, you know, when they did see him, they would know, okay, we better listen up. God has a message for us. Here's this Ezekiel character coming out of his house again, and we better pay attention. I wonder if our friends would testify to our similarity with Ezekiel uh, when they see us. Would they recognize that we are on mission for God? When they hear us, would they say our conversations are rooted in God's Word, that they're seasoned with grace and with salt and with the Gospel? Uh, probably not. But I'm not sure that's because God wants less of us than he required of Ezekiel. 
it's probably because we don't fully grasp what it means to be a follower of Christ. In Ephesians, uh, Paul talks about being a slave of Christ, uh, that he was no longer his own, that you know everything that he said and did was based on what Christ was calling him to say and do. Uh, we likely often uh, live as if we are still our own rather than living for the one who died for us. And so I want to exhort us as I finish this message today to be more like Ezekiel to maybe pray this, pray this prayer, whatever God needs me to say, wherever he needs me to go, and however he needs me to prepare, I'm his and I'm willing. Would you join me in praying that prayer? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful once again for your word and for this book, Ezekiel, that many of us, many of us have previous to now not really taken time to, to delve into and to study much. But we thank you for what we can learn from Ezekiel. We thank you, Lord, that um, you know we, we, we see you calling people to difficult ministries, just like you called Ezekiel. But you provide the message, and it can be a difficult message at times. It has bad news, and it has good news. But you also provide the means. You fill us with your Holy Spirit, enabling us to carry out the calling that you've put on our life. And I would just pray that, Father, we might become more like Ezekiel and willing to, to say, wherever you need us to, to go, whatever you need us to say, uh, however you want to prepare us, that uh, we are yours. We are willing to submit to that. And so, Lord Jesus, fill us with your Spirit. Help us to be on mission for you each and every day. Open our eyes to see the people all around us who need to hear the message of the bad news and the good news so that they too might come to faith and trust in Christ and have their sins forgiven and know that they can have eternal life when they die and abundant life right now. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's receive the benediction. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen.